This is a joint Metrans and Urban Growth uh, seminar. Seminar, um, and it's a really nice way to get at least the Metrans part of this started for the semester. I think you've already done one, right? Yeah. Um, I'm Jen Giuliano. I'm the director of the Metrans Transportation Center, um, and since Professor Bournette is actually the guest today, um, he's not hosting, so I'm hosting. Um, so my job is to introduce our illustrious speakers. Um, approximately the way this goes is we're going to follow the urban growth seminar structure. So that means that we're going to have 45 minutes um, for Professor Burnett and then followed by about 15 minutes for Professor Schweitzer to discuss. And then we will have some Q&A um, and uh, we will be finished around 1.30. Um, so now let me do some introductions. Now you all know, many of you in this room know Professor Bournette primarily uh, because he's the director of the MPL program and the PhD in planning and urban development. Um, but he has a whole other side of his life um, that has to do with research. Um, and uh, he comes to us from Princeton. His PhD is in public affairs from Princeton University. Um, he says that uh, his specializations are urban growth, transportation, regional science, and urban economics. Uh, what he doesn't say on his bio is that he is an internationally recognized expert, particularly in transportation and land use uh, interactions. Um, so you have before you somebody who has written extensively on topics that are of great interest to all of us uh, in this field. Uh, Professor Bournette also doesn't like to talk about himself, so maybe you don't know that in 2014 um, he received an award that we call the Homer Hoyt Award. Um, and some of you probably know who Homer Hoyt was, right? He had some ideas about structures of cities. Um, and uh, the people who are really good in urban economics and urban structure get this award. And Professor Bournette is one of them. So uh, let me go on to Professor Schweitzer. Um, her PhD is in urban planning from UCLA, but we hired her anyway. <laughs> um, she describes her specializations as environmental justice, sustainable transportation, um, community environmental quality, and uh, some other things. What she doesn't list is that she's one of the experts that I always go to as a person who really understands public transportation. Um, so she's obviously the right person uh, to be a discussant today. Uh, some of you know that she's teaching planning theory and is working a lot now in the area of justice and ethics. And I hope you all know that she writes a very good blog uh, that you should be paying attention to. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to Professor Bournette. I, I want to start off uh, with a little bit of stage setting. First of all, um, what I'm going to describe to you are results from a project that is in some ways still ongoing, although we've completed uh, all of our data collection that we've anticipated. We're still analyzing parts of it, but we're well into it. Uh, this has been going on for a little over three years now, so I want to give uh, a lot of credit to collaborators. Uh, my co-principal investigator in all of this has been Doug Halston, who is an assistant professor at UC Irvine. Uh, Steve Spears was our graduate student on this project uh, and really very, very early on took on a role that uh, is, it w was more that of a colleague uh, than graduate student. And so in all fairness, uh, if there are things about this presentation that impress you as being good, you need to give full credit to Professor Houston and now Professor Steve Spears, who just started this fall as an assistant professor at the University of Iowa. Uh, if there's anything about this that seems problematic, confusing, wrong, or, or, or worse, uh, more than likely I would be the person to blame. I, I'm not encouraging that, but you know. 
uh, but, but that, that might be the case. Um, so here, let me give you the first dilemma that I have. Logically, I could tell you about the results of this research in, you know, two, maybe three minutes. Um, now, this would be a problem because if I did that, my faculty appointment might be revoked. Uh, so, I, I, so clearly that's off the table. The, the two-minute version we, we can't do. Um, so what I want to do is to give you, in, in addition to the results, a little bit of the backstory of this work. Um, what, what I'm going to talk about are the results of an experimental control group travel behavior study that used the expo line as the experiment. Literally, we were asking, suppose you had people living in a place that was near a soon-to-open rail station. You drop a rail transit line on them, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, you watch how their travel behavior changes or does not change. You compare that to some set of control group people who were farther from the rail station. Um, and you're literally min mimicking the research design that we would use in clinical drug trials. Um, and, and so that's kind of the theme of this. And one thing, and I think what may have brought a lot of you out, is that the Expo line is nearby. It's interesting. We can learn about the line. Los Angeles is investing heavily in rail transit. Uh, before the Expo line phase one opened, uh, the region was scheduled to open six new rail transit lines this decade, so you could get insights into what that investment maybe is causing. Uh, but I want to step back a little bit further. I, I want to talk about the way that um, I had envisioned this. And in its genesis, this was not about the Expo line, and it wasn't even about uh, rail transit. Sometimes people have asked me, well, why did you choose the Expo line? Um, and, and when they were reporters, I hope there's no reporter in the room who would repeat this, but it's being re recorded. I know this may get out. Uh, I, I would be a little bit too embarrassed to give the real answer, which was, well, there was nothing about the Expo line per se. We needed a project. We wanted to track a project. We wanted to do an experimental control group design. The Expo line was ready to go, so to speak. But that's always a little bit embarrassing to, to, to kind of say to people. But that's the reality of, of what was happening. Um, and l let me describe the backstory to that a little bit. Um, six years ago, uh, I had a discussion uh, with uh, Dan Sperling, who directs the uh, the uh, Institute for Transportation Studies at UC Davis. He had just joined as a member of the California Air Resources Board, which is the body which is responsible at the state level for regulating air quality in California. And he began to describe to me an idea. Um, and I didn't really know where this idea was coming from, but as he laid it out, he said, you know, what we're talking about in Sacramento is an idea where we're going to go to metropolitan planning organizations and we're going to say you're required to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by a certain amount from the transportation sector uh, and you need to attain these reductions and you need to verify that you've attained these reductions um, and, and, and then we'll, they'll report it back to us. And as he described this, to me, it sounded very Sacramento top-down. I don't know if that was his intention. This was over six years ago. Uh, but it sounded like a little bit of phrasing of, we in Sacramento will go and we'll tell these folks to do these things, and then they will do it. And I began to get very concerned. And I don't know how much of this I conveyed to Dan at the time. But I was imagining uh, the greater Los Angeles context. And the Skag region, I believe, has 191 municipalities. I might be off by a couple there, but very close to it. They all have, in many cases, very different ideas about what would be an appropriate way to organize land use and transportation, how to go about uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction from the transport sector. Uh, and, and so what I began to think is, y you know, we've got to figure out a way to allow some bottom-up experimentation. If this is about Sacramento sending a memos to the MPOs, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, saying do this, in fact, they have no authority to actually tell their member cities to in some sense do anything, but if they try to send a memo doing, saying do this, it, it, it would be a disaster. Um, and, and arguably would not be a good policy framework since you would not then be allowing your member cities to pursue approaches that they would see as appropriate. Um, 
so I began to kick around in my mind, you know, would there be ways to allow localities to in some sense do their own thing? And, and, and it occurred to me that if we did that, we'd have to be able to verify would this local experimentation, what is it doing? Is it working? Is it not working? And I began to play around with this distinction between kind of a uh, top-down, you know, uh, mandate compliance approach and a bottom-up experiment and verify approach. And, and the more I thought about this, the more I thought, well, the, the, the missing linchpin is how do you actually better verify whether a lot of these experiments are working? And, and the part of the puzzle that concerned me is that what we were talking about were things that might be idiosyncratic, might be geographically small in scope, um, and might use either technologies or policies that had previously been unanticipated or not well anticipated. Uh, and the reason this mattered is that all our metropolitan planning organizations have complicated travel demand forecasting models that were built in essence to handle what you might regard as relatively simpler and anticipated transportation policies, mostly changes to investments. Build a new highway here, build a new rail line there, uh, increase, increase road capacity. You can even tweak the model to, for example, incorporate pricing, although it is a little bit of what a programmer would call a kludge. Um, but what I was imagining is you might get places beginning to experiment with parking pricing. You might see, you might see cities wanting to shut off a street and have a pedestrian mall. Uh, you might see car sharing programs. Uh, you, you, you might see employers encouraging alternative commutes or ride share. Uh, at the same time, technology was beginning to change our transportation world in fairly dramatic ways and in ways that would continue to open up the menu of what either governments or in some cases the private sector could do. So I was imagining this world where you'd have all these experiments and many of them would be outside of the fidelity of the regional model and how would you evaluate them? Um, fast forward a few years, I don't think anybody here knows this. Um, there was a time and I think it was early March as I remember, sometime in March, um, I was visiting USC uh, on what at the time was something that I wasn't really telling my UCI colleagues about, but they were, they were searching for uh, a new faculty member and I was here as part of a short list to give a talk. And I remember standing on the corner of Exposition in Figueroa and seeing a large hole that had been dug up in the ground, which was the Expo Line Trench. And um, I went back to my colleagues at Irvine and said, um, I was just up at USC, kind of move real fast, don't tell them why. Uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and they're building the expo line, they're about to open it up. What if we do an experimental control group travel behavior evaluation of the expo line? So we called up uh, LA Metro, they had an expo construction authority. Uh, this was about getting into April of uh, 2011 at that time. They said we're scheduled to open the line up sometime in the fall of 2011. So this is tough. Could we ramp up an entire study, get out there, get our baseline data collected before the line opens up? And I even asked a few people, could we do this? Is it viable? A couple of people said, no, this would be stupid. Don't do this. That hardened my thinking. I thought, wow, maybe I should do this. <laughs> people think this would be stupid. Out of the box, risky. You know, I'm a, I'm a professor. I, I don't get to take a lot of risks in my life, right? This is as far on the edge as I can get, and it was very appealing. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, um, so, so we did start the project. Um, some years later, uh, I, I discovered some notes that I had written and previously lost in discussions with Doug Halston from about a year prior where we were discussing this same idea and jotting down ideas of projects we might evaluate and one of them was, you know, Expo Line uh, and then we had just kind of put it aside and forgotten about it and so, you know, could have started the whole thing a, a year earlier <laughs> and so, um, so uh, we, we got into the project and what I want to mention is that at the time we were envisioning this as trying to really do proof of concept. Could you do 
experimental evaluations of transportation projects. Uh, could you get out of the realm that we are mostly in where we build regional models uh, calibrated with cross-sectional data where you would have a large number of questions about whether you've really demonstrated causality? Um, and it wasn't viewed as pushing that away, but could we open up an additional way to understand impacts? Um, and, and so that's the, the, the context in which we got into this. So let me start now with the general context setting and go into this. And this is what I give most other groups. Um, first of all, and I've already mentioned this a little bit, uh, Los Angeles has made a huge commitment to, to rail transit in particular. Uh, and then I think there's a lot of questions that maybe are still out there. Is that a leading edge? Will this be followed by a commitment to additional bus transit? Will it be followed by a commitment to walking, bicycling? My sense is that the answer is yes. I believe that to be the case. I could also imagine people coming in and arguing that it isn't clear, but I think it's definitely clear that LA has made a huge commitment uh, to rail transit. Um, Los Angeles, uh, as of 2009, uh, our best data indicated that one out of every uh, one out of every five trips in the Southern California Association of Governments region was a walking trip. Uh, that appears to be about 23% by 2012 data. Uh, in areas such as downtown Los Angeles, easily more than half the trips are walking trips. I mention this to point out that this is clearly an auto-oriented metropolis that is somewhat rapidly evolving into something else and does pose a lot of interesting questions about what is happening, are the investments having an effect, how is travel behavior changing? Uh, at the same time, the policy context was mostly motivated by Senate Bill 375 which was what evolved from this discussion that Dan Sperling had with me uh, in 2008. And really he was conveying discussions that were occurring in Sacramento was what was happening. And Senate Bill 375 requires that every, every metropolitan planning organization in the state uh, document that the combination of their regional transportation plan, which is really their transportation investment plan and some associated land use things, and their regional housing needs assessment, which is really uh, their affordable housing investment, that those, that combination will somehow lead to compliance with state-mandated greenhouse gas emission reduction targets from the ground transport sector. And for the Southern California Association of Governments region, that's an 8% reduction from a 2005 per capita baseline by the year 2020 and a 13% GHG reduction by 2035. Uh, the point being that because that is a quantified magnitude, uh, that in some sense really raises the bar for what these MPOs have to do. They have to demonstrate not only an association, uh, not only a direction of movement, but, but in some sense magnitude of measurement that could, uh, th th that could satisfy the Air Resources Board, which is the oversight agency for this legislation, that these targets have been met. Um, at the same time on the research side, transportation had been very bad, I will argue, at using experimental control group evaluation. Uh, and I think this was really an, intell an intellectual oddity and, and an intellectual oversight. Uh, the idea in the behavioral sciences that you could use experimental evaluations in non-experimental contexts has been around for I, I, at least, I'd say, 50 years. Now, you know, you could kind of go back and forth. When did it start? But certainly in the social, sci social sciences, by the time you get into the 1970s, th that idea is evident. So uh, transportation was some number of decades behind in not realizing that every time we build a project, we're creating an experiment, and we could, under certain circumstances, evaluate it as an experiment. And that doesn't mean that it'll work flawlessly, but my argument was that, that this is something we should be doing. It had almost never been done uh, in the rail transit realm, uh, we've identified two previous studies with work in progress in Seattle, and there's not much going on elsewhere. So th there was really, like I said, this was in many ways on the research side, a, a, a proof of concept and really trying to popularize a a an idea for this kind of experimental control group evaluation. Um, let me tell you about the Expo Line study. 
so now I'm getting into kind of a more standard, um, you know, research talk type of approach. I'll tell you about the study area, uh, study waves and survey methods, variable study design results. So, you know, th th that's the kind of slide only a mother could love, right? You know, uh, tell me, you know, I mean, if, if, you know, tell me what you're doing. I would tell them that, you know, I think even my mom would, would, would not be wowed by that slide. But <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Hoping, but, but now, right, there's, there's no place to go but up. Here's a new slide that has maps. <laughs> uh, the study area, um, the expo line, the, uh, you'll see where it's situated in Los Angeles. You all know this if you're from the region. Uh, but the expo line on the bottom portion of the page runs from uh, essentially near downtown, starting at 7th Street Metro Center, going uh, mostly south until it essentially hits the corner of the USC campus and then turns west. Phase one ends at Culver City, and phase one is the object of our study. Um, phase one opened on April 28, 2012. Culver City Station uh, actually opened uh, three months later on June 20th of 2012. So Metro was kind enough to, to engage in some construction and opening delays for us while we were collecting our baseline data. And if anyone's here from Metro, that's much appreciated. By the way, I was constantly that fall calling Metro saying, do you have any idea of when the opening date would be? And they, they could never exactly say, and they were getting a great deal of pressure. You know, how soon can you open? And at one point I actually told the person I was talking to, I said, look, understand, uh, I'm the one person in the LA region who, if you tell me you're delayed in opening, I get happy. Uh, but, but, uh, but at any rate, uh, we decided to uh, work only with the six westernmost stations on Expo Phase 1, starting at the station at Western and going out to uh, the station at Culver City. The stations that are farther to the east uh, were problematic for two reasons. Uh, uh, some of those stations border the USC campus. The USC campus takes a lot of land area out of the um, uh, half-mile circles that, I, that I've drawn around there. Um, and we were surveying residents. The short story is that if you were trying to survey residents where people don't live, uh, you can't find them. And so that was problematic. Going north of USC, those are stations that either had pre-existing transit service or were very close to places with pre-existing, particularly rail transit service. We were not as convinced that that was as pure of an experiment, and so we wanted to stick to these six stations. Um, we drew half-mile boundaries around each station, as you'll see on the map. That's our experimental area. Um, and then we chose a control group area, which is the balance of the area that is hashed in by this red dotted line. Um, and that control group area was built in uh, based on a couple of criteria. Uh, the expo line in this area essentially goes through what you might imagine would be kind of the northern part of South Los Angeles. Now really this region, um, I, I, I will tell you, I, I walk around there and you can get people who live there kind of giving you, like I'd say about three or four different names for where they're living. It's kind of a transition zone. It might be West LA might be South Los Angeles, it might be West Adams. So, you know, our thinking, at, just looking at maps, is this looks like the southern port of South Los Angeles. We want to stay within South Los Angeles to have a location that is kind of in the same sub-regional setting. Um, and then building up the control group area from census block groups, we tried to pick locations that looked demographically similar, which, is not, which was not completely possible uh, the northern part of the area is uh, more, more Hispanic than any other ethnic group. As you go south, it becomes more African-American, uh, although it's quite comparable in terms of income, employment, poverty rates, things like that. So we tried to build up an area that looked demographically similar. The portion going straight down along the Crenshaw line, uh, originally we thought that some, in some future date, the data we're getting there might stand as a baseline for some future study of Crenshaw rail access. And we even built in this area that is somewhat to your right, where there were no planned future rail improvements um, to, to have a, a group that would have presumably no transportation improvements in the foreseeable future. Um, that also influenced the choice of, of control area some. Um, and then we invited residents of the control area into the study. Uh, and surveyed those residents in three waves. Uh, wave one 
uh, approximately three to seven months before Expo Line opening, and we had 284 households complete the uh, survey and travel tracking protocol in wave one. And then we went back to those households in two successive waves. So this is a true panel. Every household who is in a later wave, and what I'm describing to you, uh, was in the, the previous waves. Wave two, uh, fall of the next year, there's seasonality to travel. So we were staying with fall. We always tried to open after LA Unified Schools had opened. We started travel collection then. We engaged in these interesting, discuss discussion, interesting discussions about when do we have to shut down travel data collection so that we're not bumping into the oddities of the Thanksgiving holiday and Christmas breaks and things like that to try to capture what we thought were kind of more normal travel. Uh, wave two, we have 204 of the 284 households came back. Wave three, we had 174 households come back. Um, we also, everything I just described to you, we call our core sample. This is a sample of pre-existing residents. You don't get into the study unless you lived in the study area as of fall of 2011, meaning before the expo line opened up. We did also survey new movers, people who moved into the Expo Line area after the Expo Line opened up. I'm not going to tell you anything about those data. Data collection are complete. We haven't been able to analyze them very much. So this will only be a talk about what happened to pre-existing residents. Uh, I just mentioned this to say there's a lot going on here. <laughs> um, so um, what we have here, if you want to see kind of like a, a graph of where the study households live with the experimental areas, these half mile rings around stations, the control group areas being the balance of this. This is where they, li they live. In every wave, they are split roughly 50-50 across that half mile experimental control group boundary. Uh, and we have taken care to make sure that those stars are big enough that we don't believe that any of you could take this and figure out where an individual household lives. So we believe that we are preserving their anonymity. Uh, again, important. Um, as the part of the protocol, in every wave, we had a household complete a seven-day travel diary. Uh, it should really say a seven-day trip log. It's, it's not a full travel diary. That's a little bit of a detailed piece of information, but all we really had them do was count their trips by mode. For all household members age 12 and older, uh, we had a fairly large survey that um, asked them to self-report their income, uh, a large boundary of socio-demographic characteristics, and also two sets of attitudinal questions, both of which were fairly extensive. One was about attitudes towards the environment and their own preferred method of travel. And then the second was their their, both their attitude uh, towards safety uh, and their experiences with both safety and harassment uh, while riding transit. You're not going to hear about either of those, but those are also interesting elements that we have. Um, and then in 141 of the Wave 1 households, uh, we had one adult carry both a GPS device and an accelerometer for the entirety of the seven-day time period. Um, and then those same households who continued the survey also carried the GPS and the accelerometer. So what we have is half of our households self-report all their travel data. And in half of those households, they both self-report and carry these two devices, the small GPS device, um, which you can kind of carry with you in a pocket or a backpack, and the accelerometer you wear on your hip with a belt, uh, and it will track physical activity and give you an objective measurement of physical activity and, um, uh, and, and makes an interesting fashion statement also, something I had not realized as a principal investigator until we were training the students who would go out there and equip these folks and say, okay, wear the thing for seven days, and they'd walk around and they would say, this doesn't look so cool, and I'd <laughs> say, join the club. Uh, <laughs> and so, okay, all right. So anyway, uh, the self-reporting, they would log on a form that looked like this for each day, the number of trips they would take by several modes. Uh, they would also self-report both number of trips and number of minutes, bicycle and walking. Those two questions were drawn from the same format in the International Physical Activity Questionnaire. So we're dealing with questions that we thought had been uh, validated through that previous 
set of research on that. And they used a vehicle mileage log where they report the vehicle odometer for every vehicle in the household. Uh, this is pretty useful. Uh, one of the main results we have is from vehicle miles of travel. That is what I'm going to show you is from the vehicle mileage logs. Uh, while it's self-reported, we have a relatively high level of confidence in that since we are asking people to write down the odometer. Because we ask them to write start and end points for every day, we have a reasonable amount of ability to identify and even in some cases correct things that look like transcribing errors you know did the start uh, odometer point on Friday was that the same as the end odometer point on Thursday if not can we figure it out and so th this was pretty useful and, and, and actually more useful than just saying start the week in the week give us two numbers I'm glad we actually asked them to give the numbers to us every day um, from all this, it is getting wonky now. I'm going to tell you what variables we formed. We formed many travel variables. Uh, we formed daily household vehicle miles traveled. Um, we formed number of car trips for the household. Everything I showed you will be for the household daily averages over the seven day period. Uh, transit trips, walk trips, bike trips, walk minutes, and bicycle minutes. That's what you'll see throughout the rest of the presentation. We have every one of those variables daily average over the seven day for the household. Um, so the key thing that we want to do um, is to do something like this. Uh, so uh, now there's two kinds of audiences that I give this talk in front of. I would call those audiences economists and regular people. So for an economist, they don't like this slide because it doesn't have enough equations on it. It's not obscure en enough. And of course, regular people don't like this slide because there's a very simple concept that I'm obscuring with an equation. So uh, the main thing that we want to do in this is what an economist would call a differences in differences estimator or, or, or what a regular person would say. Can you take the value of a variable in an experimental group? subtract off the value of the variable for the control group, do that after the expo line opens, do that before the expo line opened, did that difference, experimental versus control, change? So part of it is if the experimental and the control group households have the same vehicle miles traveled before the expo line opened up, do you see changes, do you see differences? after the expo line opened. And it can even control for the possibility that maybe they weren't traveling exactly the same way before the expo line opened, since all you're looking at is literally a change and a difference. Um, so once we get this far, for some reason that I don't fully understand, even though I'm the one who did it, I show you another map of the study area in the households, uh, breaking down the responses for wave one, control experimental, um, no, now we're at wave two. This is the number of people who did both wave one and wave two. Uh, in every wave, if you have the half mile boundary, we have about half the sample in the control, half in the experimental, about half of them carried GPS and accelerometer, about half didn't. Uh, so at this point, we ask three questions. Um, are the data reasonable compared to other travel data? First question. We're out there, we're collecting data. This is all re re original data collection. Are we getting things that correspond to the things that national and state data sets will tell us, you know, are reasonable? Because if we're not, we've got a bit of a problem. Secondly, are there any differences in travel behavior before the Expo line opened up, experimental versus control group? Uh, they don't have to be the same, but it would be interesting to know at baseline before the Expo line opened up, were there differences? And then third thing, kind of the big question, are there differences after opening? So the, the first question, and I kid you not, um, I worried about this a fair amount. We're going out there, we're surveying people. Are they giving us answers that have kind of face validity, given what we know about how people travel? So what you see on the left-hand side is for every one of our key travel variables, the average for the study area uh, from our baseline pre-opening data. And then the next column is the average for the 2009 National Household Travel Survey for the 50 households who lived within this same study area. And we would expect correspondence. Uh, and not only that, these are generally numbers that are, uh, once you adjust for income, 
very, uh, very stable across different surveys. And if we were far from it, we, we would have a real problem. Now, at the time that we were able to do this comparison, I would say we had spent ballpark, I, I'm thinking, about $300,000. So I am actually authentically worrying, what if we have data that just look awful and how do I explain it to the funders and I don't exactly know the answer to that question. Good news, never pretty much had to explain that. The data are, are, are almost right on. Vehicle miles travel from our data, 27 miles per household per day. NHTS data, 24 miles per household per day. Look at the income of the people who live in this area. Look at national samples or just for that income. This is about where you should be. Um, daily car trips, it looks like we are underestimating a little bit. Bus trips. We're shockingly right on. Uh, train trips, there's almost nothing going on. Of course, there's no rail service in this neighborhood at that time. Um, walk trips, we are, we are overestimating by a fair amount. Uh, although we did have possibly, it's unclear. Our, our method of surveying walking may have captured more walk trips. To me, on the whole, this looks pretty good. So I, I'm going to say good news on question number one. We're getting data that look reasonable and they look they, they look relatively solid so i'm going to move on to question number two before the expo line opened up was there any difference in travel behavior uh, now by the way I, in fact i didn't ask how many of you are, are students I, I am displaying t statistics throughout you have to understand um, i just show people t statistics and i think every person should know a t statistic and know how to interpret it and in a different context uh, we can grouse about whether or not it's the case, but I'm not changing my mind. <laughs> and so, so what you see is for every one of our kind of key travel variables, the average value for the experimental group, the average value for the control group, this is all baseline, what we call wave one, before the expo line opened up. The magnitude of the difference between those two and the t-statistic for whether or not that difference is statistically, statistically significant. Uh, and the shorthand would be if that t-statistic was ever larger than 2, you would say, yes, these values are actually different in the underlying population. So we're finding no pre-opening differences in travel behavior. Didn't have to be that way, but it's, but it's kind of good news. It's certainly the simplest story to believe. So then the last thing is, uh, were there any differences after the Expo line opened up? Here's where it'll get really bizarre. There's only one answer to this question. I'll show you that answer four ways. You will find that every answer, every one of those four ways is the same number. So I don't know why I do this. Uh, so let's go through this. Uh, first of all, if we were to look at after opening, the same exact table, after Expo line opened up, what do the average per household, per day, travel behavior variables look like. Differences have now opened up. The control group has a mean VMT per day of about 32 miles. The experimental group has a mean VMT per day of about 22 miles. That's actually an increase for the control group, a decrease for the experimental group, and they're almost of about the same magnitude. Uh, and that is a uh, mean difference of about 10 miles per day, and it's statistically significant. Uh, that, that number will kind of keep popping up over and over again, and arguably every test that I'm doing is not really that much of a different test. So that's, that's part of why the number keeps popping up. Let me see uh, what else is happening. Train trips, uh, uh, the experimental group has more train trips than the control group. That number with the half mile boundary kind of goes back and forth, whether it is statistically significant. In our most recent work, we have now flipped to a uh, one kilometer straight line boundary and it looks like at that distance, we are getting very consistent statistical significance uh, for the difference in rail transit trips and the increase. And part of that, we'd always kind of intended, we picked a half mile initially, informed by the literature, but we always knew we could kind of go back and, you know, l look at these things with more distance. The walk minutes thing is more commonly going to be insignificant. So I encourage you to not pay as much attention to that. And the same thing with bicycle trips. Um, what happened only among the experimental group? Uh, they have, before opening to after opening, a decrease in their VMT and an increase in their train trips. What happened to the uh, control group before opening to after opening? They have an increase in VMT. Um, and let me go down to one more specification. Running uh, an actual regression. 
and controlling for all this and also controlling for household characteristics, size of the household, number of vehicles, we get in this specification a difference of about uh, uh, 12 miles per day. Interpreted, interpreted literally as an impact of the Expo line, you could say that the experimental group reduced their household travel by 12 miles per household per day relative to the control group after the Expo line opened up. Uh, we played around a fair amount with outliers. Um, generally, this is, this is pretty robust to removing outliers. What I'm showing you is quite old. And in fact, at the time, we were using an outlier exclusion criterion based on household travel per day. Uh, we've since revised that to actually uh, an outlier exclusion criteria based on uh, per capita travel per day. And if you do say your outlier exclusion criterion is to exclude households that um, traveled more than 100 miles per day, which sounds like a lot, could be a lot, then this different, this, this, this effect from the Expo line will go insignificant. Uh, although the interesting thing, and this is something that I think we're not going to get agreement about, but one interesting thing is that we discovered in this, we've got a very small sample. So you do bump into questions that you don't bump into with large samples. And one of the questions is, when are you no longer removing outliers and you're starting to remove data? You will find that your statistics books don't have a magic bright line answer to this question. But we are thinking at the 100 mile uh, per day criterion that we might actually be getting close to removing data. That's the 90th percentile of household VMT for the SCAG region from the 201 diary. Uh, and that kicks out 7% of our observations. Um, and and, and I'm, people, I, I don't think that people will agree on this, but at this point we were thinking actually this might be real travel. And this is one of the things that to some extent will always be vexing in these small samples is that you'll see changes bump around. Uh, and, and you can play a lot of games of uh, is this real, is this, is this idiosyncratic. And what we've tried to do is develop criteria that seem reasonable and just, just go with them. And this approximate 10 mile per day reduction in VMT after the Expo line opened up seems robust to those criteria. Last thing I want to show you, and then I'm pretty much going to have to wrap up, is um, I know the type on this is pretty small, but we do have a third wave of data 18 months after opening. And um, if we look at that third wave of data, uh, and, and what this is, is this is currently only the households that completed data collection all the way through the third wave. So the sample size in this estimation got even smaller. Still you have at the very upper right quarter, corner of that table that statistically significant uh, about 10 mile, 9.36 mile difference between experimental and control group. Uh, what we haven't done yet, since we have extra, extra data, we could pool the second and third wave. I think it will hold up. So the short story is that, uh, again, we, we collected a third wave of data. It seemed to be the same story that the second wave of data told us. Uh, some of this, if you, if, you, um, if, if you have kind of, I'd say, mild OCD. I don't think this is a study you should do because I swear that there were times in this where I thought, why in the world did we ever say we were going to do a third wave of data collection? Who does that? You know, but of course it was a sensible and correct thing to do. But, but yeah, you, gotta, you, 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 you can't worry too much in the middle of these things. Uh, there's a many more slides here, none of which I can show you. Let me kind of go all the way to a uh, concluding slide to wrap this up and give some time for our uh, discussant. The main result we're getting is uh, that household VMT per day is dropping by about 10 miles per day. That's a combination of a reduction in driving from the experimental group and an increase in driving from the control group. It's fairly robust. We, we, we've tried to break the result. We think doing reasonable things, we can't. Um, uh, we are getting an increase uh, in, rail in rail trips, and this is kind of an old slide, so it says in some specifications. Uh, what we now, what we now think that that result is somewhat more robust when we, when we push the experimental boundary out a little bit. No change in bus trips at all. In fact, if you looked at the slides that I moved past you fairly quickly, you would find that in, in the experimental group there was actually a <laughs> reduction in bus ridership. Uh, I don't believe it was statistically significant, but there was a reduction in bus service. 
that happened coincident with the opening of the Expo line so that you don't actually get a statistically significant increase in all transit trims. And this whole walking thing, uh, right now I'm, I'm not going to encourage you to pay a lot of attention to that. So let me go to the last couple of slides, flash before your eyes where you can go for more information. We are analyzing the data, trying to get out there. There are several reports, and I, since I know that this uh, is being recorded, you could go back to the recording and go all the way to the end and find these reports and read more. Uh, and I do want to say a thank you. I, I feel like that uh, I, I'm thanking a cast of thousands, and uh, maybe it is. Uh, a lot of entities funded us. I'm very grateful to them. Uh, they are all listed on the left-hand side. I won't name them all. They are up there. Very appreciative to all of them. Uh, and then lots of research assistants, again, who I am not, uh, who, I, who I won't name all of them, uh, including a large number of USC students, uh, I believe all of whom on the master's side have graduated, not all the PhD students, uh, but we had kind of small armies of uh, master's students who had to go out uh, and assist with the GPS and accelerometer data collection. And so thank you to all these people. Uh, and let me wrap up and uh, turn the floor over. One of the things that's really nice about um, being able to have this discussion is that this facility is right outside our front door and we get to interact with it all the time. Um, without without um, any qualification, uh, Marlon is one of the very best social scientists there is in planning research. And uh, he and I, for years before we hired him, would go back and forth in reviews. I'd review him, he'd review me. It was constant. I could have sort of figured like the only way I could ever get him to shut up was to hire him so they wouldn't send my, him my stuff anymore. And it actually worked out beautifully for both of us, I think. Um, <laughs> Marlon and I disagree a lot on the interpretation of these studies. And in many respects, they're all very good studies. And I'm going to rain on his parade a little bit just because, you know, you're going to stay. It's, you know, it's been a long talk already. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how it doesn't really matter. Right, for practice, a lot of the research points that I'm going to point out are not really that meaningful, right? So Marlon spent quite some time talking about how in transportation there had been a lot of criticism that there were not uh, good quality experimental studies on behavioral change before and after, right? Um, and he's absolutely right. And one of the things for those of you who are PhD students in the audience that you should take away from this is that Marlon is extremely adroit about positioning his work so that people pay attention. Right? So he's like, I need to think about this research gap. It's a very high profile research gap. I'm going to see what I can do to try to fill into it rigorously. Right? So these difference in different designs are out there. And for those of us who are grumpies, right, we don't necessarily buy into the fact that this is actually at the experimental level of rigor. The reason is that it's actually really hard to do that in real applied planning research. You don't really get to randomize where people live, right? And that's kind of at the heart. You may be able to randomize who you pick in the neighborhood, but you don't get to pick who lives in that neighborhood before you start picking subjects, right? And you still run the risk of what uh, the smart people call post hoc ergo propter hoc attribution of causation. So we've got the real world going on here. He's got a before and after. We've got this train that wasn't there before and is there before, but that's not the only thing that changed in the world, right? And one of the ways that we know it's not the only thing that changed in the world is what? The experimental group changed too. Before and after they changed. And they, they went up by a lot, right? That suggests that something happened with gas prices, which in practice is good, right? We can interpret that result in a good way. In research, is a problem, right? Now, why is it a good thing in practice? Well, if gas prices changed and people started driving more, right, that means they may actually be underestimating the type of behavioral change you see with new rail supply if gas prices were higher, right? They got a good, significant, solid result, right, even in the conditions that are not necessarily favorable to people switching. Right? You got people in that control group driving more for a reason. Right? And those people are right there. Right? Now that's one of the problems for it on the research side though, is those folks are right there. Why'd they start driving more? Right? And second, first, why'd they start driving more? And second, is that actually related to the change too? Right? 
Is it that we've got folks who are just outside that going, oh, you know what, some of those creeps are on the train and I can now drive more, woo! Right? And if you're actually worried about the amount of emissions and driving in the world, it's not enough just to take some cars off the road with transit. You want cars off the road, period. Right? More people driving more or fewer people driving more so that aggregate amount of fuel consumption goes up with climate change is not what we want. So we've got a bit of a puzzle there. Right? We got a bit of a puzzle there. He may want to start fiddling with those data. Second thing, and this is why, okay, so for those of you who are PhD students, I gave you your a little bit. For those of you on the practice side, this stuff about experimentation, it's not really all that germane. Right? Nobody goes out to any marketing firm and expects them to do like real laboratory experiments on anything when they're thinking about presenting people with a new product, which is essentially what we are doing when we present people with a new mode. Right? One of my buddies from graduate school over at UCLA had what I considered to be the best beat on this ever. He'd say, his name was Mark Garrett. He'd say, Lisa, we ain't looking for a genetic predisposition to ride the train. We're not, right? We're asking questions about what people do when they have new supply, right? This is really important to practice, really important to practice. Why? Well, it's important to practice in a number of reasons. One is just on the forecasting side. We know, for example, in the mobility market for transit, we have people in group A, right? These are riders. Right? When they think about where they're going to live in a city, they don't move into a neighborhood unless there's transit. Right? For them, it's a big ticket item. It's somebody like me, I don't know how to drive a car. I don't look at Los Angeles neighborhoods that don't have halfway decent transit access. Right? So that group A, we know, does not live in a neighborhood that doesn't have transit in it yet. Right? There's group B. Right? They might take it or they might not, depending on service. They're the maybes, right? They're, they're the maybes. Like, we like the maybes. They could be influenced, and we like the A's. Then there are just the no's, right? These people are not taking public transit, right? They are all like the Burgermeister Meister Burger. No, no, no. Public transit is socialism. I won't do it. It's dirty. It's smelling. It's full of creepy people. I don't want to do it. No, 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 no. And if you don't, people, if you don't think those people are out there, then you do not work in public transit because they're out there. Now the question for those of us who would be interested in what happens in these new markets is, okay, so we've got an area of the city, and it's got a train line running through it, yay, happy train, right? Well, we want to build a new one, right? We want to build a new one in a place that doesn't have any of that. If we take forecasts that are based on this, we've got a big problem, right? Because we've got people from A over here, and we've got people from, C, from B over here, right? And maybe we've got some people from C over there. We just don't really know. But what do we know about this? We know we don't have any of group A in there. Those are the real hardcore riders. So we start putting supply over here. Chances are we're running the risk of overestimation. And we do it. There's nothing we can do about that when we base forecasts on this and try to take it into this. The key question for those of us in practice is always, how in this universe, which we know are B's and C's, right? we know of the people, no, shan't. We'll not get on your nasty train. <laughs> right? Shan't. Right? Versus the people who are like, oh, you know, if it's, you know if, it's, if it's good service, I might, I might do it. We've never known. Right? The relative size of those groups or the relative behavior of this group once it gets transit. Right? So Marlin's work here actually gives us some intel on B. Right? When you capture the bees, how do they behave? How much do they take it? Right? Is it enough to move the dial? Or do they kind of hop on now and then when they need to, you know, want to go out some night to Dorothy Chandler Pavilion and they want to drink a little too much and take the train home? <coughs> well, actually, the answer is, you know, the bees here at least are pretty active riders. That's good to know, right? For practice, it's key to know, right? Uh, one last thing. Um, the, the sample size is a problem, right? He's just going to run into a hard brick wall 
of what he can do with these data, which is unfortunate because a careful panel design like this would be so nice to have with bigger numbers. Uh, simply because with these smaller numbers, you just have a limit as to how many explanatory variables you can stick in. You lose power so fast, right? And that's not what we want. We'd like to be able to do a lot more with these data. Oh, and final, final thing. I do have one more final, final, final thing. <laughs> um, I actually think that in further studies here, um, as somebody who is an A, I, I know that we have some empirical studies establishing that a half mile is about the buffer. I live a mile away. I live over on the, you guys come see me. I live on the corner of Washington and Crenshaw. I walk down Crenshaw to the Expo Line station there, and that's a lot farther, right? That's about a mile or so, right? And I'm not the only person who does that. And I just do it because I'm too lazy to transfer to the bus, and it's the only exercise I get because I'm a professor too, right? Um, so there's part of me that feels like we, in some respects, don't understand walking well enough to really say what's a control group here and what's actually a treatment group because I actually think the treatment buffer might actually be bigger. This, what Marlon and team did here, was standard state of the practice with assumptions, but I actually think we could push out a little further and we might be kind of surprised, which then leads us to the whole notion of, you know, how much coverage would we actually need down here before the folks in Chesterfield Square right, we're, par we're actually part of the group that really did experience a supply chain, a, a supply change. Part of your control group was set up so that it could potentially feed into the Trent LAX project as well if a similar study was done. Is there going to be a similar study done on that project? So that was the grand plan. Um, a, a lot of things in life don't quite turn out the way you imagine them. Uh, I, I, so the sample size is much too small, much smaller than we had hoped for, by the way. Uh, and I think that would really limit a future study that just tries to flip that group. We, we'd have to refresh it. Uh, the other thing, I, I would love to redo this. I think that uh, it, it would be great if there were several of these kinds of studies going on in different locations so you could build up a body of knowledge to give you a different insight, so I may try that. These things are generally difficult to fund. We, we, we had great success, but um, uh, it, it, is, it is tough to fund. Uh, and, and we had a lot of very willing partners, and I, I haven't quite tried asking them if they're in this for a second round. So, you know, we'll see. So do you think you report, uh, your report can tell that uh, if we build more railway system in Los Angeles, it will persuade the public to use the public transit more and change their like a transit habit? You couldn't infer that from this study. This is, this is one case study. Um, and, and one of the things about this research design is that it's really just a case study. Arguably, I think the right way to view this is here's what happened in the Expo Line Phase 1. What would happen in Expo Line Phase 2 in a very different kind of context? I think the best answer is we don't know. Let's get out there and see. Presumably, if you had a lot of these studies, you could begin to make inferences like, hey, we, we, we did a study that looked like it was in a very similar location with a similar population. But I don't think we have that. So I, 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 th these are case study in nature. Um, I, I think you could have maybe a little more confidence that maybe rail in general would change behavior than you would have if we had found nothing, but I would kind of say just, just a little. Um, I, let me ask Professor Schweitzer what I she think thinks. That's the right, I think that's the right answer. I mean, we have what we have here, and it's promising. Uh, one of the things that I think, and this is frustrating because you know, you're not dealing with an even distribution of the population around the stations here. You've got a lot of commercial development right there and a lot of empty land space because this is right after this opens. And then when you get like even a mile away, then you're really getting into a lot of residential areas. So his potential to act, and this is one of the reasons why I'd like to be able to expand that spatial buffer a little bit because you really would capture way more residences than you are with land uses that currently just don't house people yet. We have a lot of baseline land use data that we've collected. Uh, we haven't used it a lot. 
for the most part, there's, there's hard, I, I'm going to say there's no association between pre-existing land use and ridership. We found some stuff, but I'm not so sure how confident I am. So let's say right now, no association. Um, part of it, the whole study was designed to try to pick up what you might imagine would be a pure rail transit effect. So one thing we know is that you build these stations and that there often is transit-oriented development that follows, and then you change development, and then that might encourage travel change. We actually wanted to get out there so fast that there had not been development that had been induced by the station after it opened, and we feel like there wasn't. So it was in some sense, you know, if you wondered what happens if you build a TOD, that, that, would, st that would be a study that would have to happen down the road. I was wondering if you considered um, the issue of people, because they're involved in the study so much, um, if that an influence whether or not they decide to go on the train. Because if they're keeping track of their mouths every day, and really paying attention to all this stuff, it might influence their behavior. Well, that's a, it's a social desirability bias question in filling out travel surveys, and we know that it is an issue, right? We know that it's an issue. Uh, it's one of those things that I don't usually bring up in comments simply because it's an issue with just about all sort of self-reports. So nobody beats their kids on surveys either, right? But we know that child abuse is a real thing. Um, it, it is possible that there might actually be a surveillance effect happening here too. There might be some sort of trying to please the, give the, give the, uh, give the interviewers or the, give the t research team things that there are, just the fact that people just don't want to admit that they're sort of lazy slobs. Um, so they, you know, they've got this accelerometer and normally they would be like watching swamp people, but they're like, well, I've got this accelerometer on, I'd better go take a couple laps around the neighborhood, otherwise I'll look like a total slob, you know? It does happen, you know, the thing about it is once you've been in the research game as long as both Marlon and, and I have, let alone Jen, <laughs> Um, <laughs> that was funny, guys. It really was. Um, <laughs> she took a while. Um, you know, it's, it's there in everything you do unless you are capturing closed circuit, you know, stuff too. It, it's really hard. You know, it's really hard. All you can do is trust your subjects and hope that they're, they're being as good as possible. But it is a real concern yeah. about, you know, when you've got low numbers, one of the ways you can try to get around it is also by starting, trying to triangulate information. Right? Yeah. So one of the things you might want to do in a future study is to just, in addition to the sort of the stuff that they're carrying around, um, you know, look for evidence from social media behavior or anything else that they might give you, right? where they might be a little less likely to associate what you're doing with, um, with actually monitoring their behavior. Yeah, yeah. Let me mention, that's something that we've thought of a, a, a lot. Um, and, and you know, the classical phrase for that would be a Hawthorne effect, right? You know, that the article from the early 1900s where they went into a factory and said, hey, we're going to adjust the lighting to see if it makes you more productive. Uh, and they found that everything they did made the workers more productive because they knew they were being watched. And it was just the <laughs> fact of knowing they were being, in some sense, experimented on or monitored. Um, we wondered about that a lot. Um, and I think part of the answer is what Lisa just said. I think it's something you can wonder about with any survey, right? You know, I did not know that nobody reported that they beat their children, but, um, <laughs> you know. But I guess in a way it's well, reassuring, I guess, to, I don't know. But anyway, let me get off that. <laughs> uh, let me not go too far down that path. And maybe I prefer the world where everyone accurately self-reports. That's probably the better world. But anyways. The um, thing you need to do is kind of ask yourself, are, there, are these responses any worse than any other travel diary? Yeah. And we don't actually yeah. have any evidence that it is. Part of it, let me explain what we did do on that, though. We, we at one point thought we would compare the self-report to the GPS. Uh, but we asked people to carry the GPS, and our main result is from the vehicle odometers. Uh, and in essence, there's just not enough congruence between those to figure out any way to cross-check the one with the other. We've, we tried quite a lot. If I was going to redo this, I'd attach a, a GPS to the car also, because then that'd be really cool. Th there are a few reasons why we're not overly worried about that. In the protocol, we never told people we were studying the expo line. Uh, we said, we're studying transportation in your neighborhood. Truthfully, they all figured it out. I mean, every, I mean we, we would have our, our student RA say, hey, people ask me, is this about the expo line? What do we tell them? And you know, we'd say, well, well, the protocol is it's about investment in your neighborhood. But yeah, they all knew that. The, the things that give us a little more confidence are um, our main result is VMT. And we kind of went through the line of logic. You know, if, if people are going to tell us what we want to know, 
they might pump up rail ridership. Are, are they going to pump down VMT? And we thought maybe, but that's kind of a second step. We're asking them to report an odometer log, although they could just flat out lie, and presumably under some kind of Hawthorne effect might. Um, the control group went up. And, and that is a problem in some circumstances, but we think for classic Hawthorne effect, it actually suggests that that may not be part of what's going on because then that gets to be a bizarre story, right? People in the control group know that we're looking for a reduction in VMT. They know they can help pump that up by upping their VMT. So now, so it's, it's a real threat. Some of these things, you just never know. And, and I am a big fan. If you get out there, you report the results. Other researchers get out there also. And, and you need a lot of studies and eventually you have a body of knowledge. And so, you know, uh, so, so I think w the, the, the most truthful answer is this is something that one would wonder about. You'd want to find ways to get at that. I am kind of a methodologist. And part of what I do in my research is I try to innovate in methodology. And part of what innovate means is, you know, kind of find methodologies that have been applied in one place and not another, you know. I don't know how, but that's, that's the way I innovate. Um, so I had very, very high hopes for this methodology. And one thing that happens every single time when you get into this is you go into the research with all of the positives in your mind of the advantage of the methodology. And then through the research, you see the shortcomings. And I think that there are two shortcomings that pertain to your question. One is this is a case study. In some sense, it can't generalize. Any study on a set of survey subjects is inherently a, a case study of that underlying population, but these before and after studies are even more so case studies. The other thing, the method is inherently a black box. And what we get out is just this black box, something happened, the most kind of, the, 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 the least interpretive way to phrase it is something happened coincident with the opening of a rail line. Um, and VMT went down. Um, and one interesting thing is how much did rail ridership go up? And um, it, doesn't, it doesn't explain the whole drop in VMT. Uh, and I want to try to break that down a little more and try to actually play games of how much of the drop in VMT could we explain with increases in rail ridership. But I've just from back of the envelope, it's not going to be all of it. So it's, it's a little bit of a mystery. Uh, and, and you'd love to be able to break into that. And, and we didn't design the study to do that. And so, you know, um, which, which means that there are future studies that I could do that would be all that so much better. I have a, actually a, a question on this very topic, and that is, um, do we know who's employed in your survey? Um, we could know that. I, I'm, I'm almost certain we, we, we queried it. Yeah. Who's, who's employed in yeah. each group? Yeah. Um, I'm interested in this question of how many built-in assumptions you have about how far you know, people will walk to get to transit. And I was thinking maybe the way to get around that is to actually look at the people who are on the train. And you know, if you took the methodology and you took the ridership and then you found out how people got there, you know, dealt with the first mile and the last mile or however far it is, that would give us an, a window into this this issue of, you know, are people walking or biking or getting dropped off or taking the bus? And is it really a constraint? How how important is it to be very, very close to the train versus just knowing that it's there and then overall it's available to take care yeah. of? Yeah. Yeah. There's also park and ride facilities at, at these um, stops. So for those of you who want to direct people to a parking place for game day, that one down by me over on Expo and, and uh, um, at Crenshaw never ever has anybody in it until there's church on Sunday. So you park basically for free, just slide on down the Expo line and go to the game. Yep. But some of that um, are things we wish we knew, but we don't. Uh, because we didn't ask a full travel diary, we just asked a trip log. So now with the, for walking, we've tried. We think some of the walking trips we can identify from the GPS, so we can know a little bit, but with a subset of the sample. Um, so some of it we could know and haven't tried to mine. Um, part of it, 
there's a weird kind of tension. When we made the decision to go with seven days of tracking, and there's a lot of good reasons to do that, one day is a very idiosyncratic snapshot of anyone's travel. Uh, but then it was a very detailed protocol, so we had to trim back elsewhere. And one of the places we trimmed is instead of going for a full dra diary, we went for a trip log. And so this is, and, and this is how it works. And I, I don't know that I would change that, but you know, um, I might tweak it. I might reconsider it if I was going to redo this again. I don't know if my impression is right that the effect of opening a new real transit is less uh, significant in after 18 months than that after six months. I, I, I don't know if my understanding is right. And that, does it imply that the effect of the new real transit is just a short-term effect? I don't think it was less significant. You mean less statistically significant? I, I mean, it might be. I yeah. throw these He's actually slides. not wrong about that. I was okay. going to comment on that. So, but I Meaning, I so tell me what was in my slides. I <laughs> <laughs> well, it basically means, and I actually think it may be essentially that you've got all this real interest as soon as the line opens, right? And, you know, um, there are some people who are going to try it and they're going to discover that it works really well for them and they're going to stick with it. And there are going to be other people who find that it's just not really where they want it to be yet. Right? And, it's po and, and, it, and we don't expect this to be completely flat across the whole lifetime of the rail project. Right? We expect there to be these ebbs and flows because the rail system is developing. Metro, right, MTA is, is messing right, with bus routing and scheduling at the same time. So that's changing the options that people have. So think about it this way. You start off and it works really well and then somewhere like in an unrelated place, simply be between your, your home and your trip to work, MTA like reduces frequency on one of your on, on the on the bus line that you have to transfer to all of a sudden the service is much less useful to you and it's completely unrelated to the new supply and so looking at it at these points in time you're going to see these kinds of things happening but that overall we hope the trajectory starts to move up and stabilize right but you won't necessarily see it within a few months of opening or even a year after opening we're talking about you know after it's been there a decade okay uh, the first thing I want to do is let's have a round of applause for our speakers um, the second thing that I want to do is recognize the people who actually organized this affair. Um, and that's Kristen Rose over here, right? Um, and Janet Kleinman in the back. And Catherine Showalter up front. Uh, so uh, this as you can imagine, was not an easy task to get 110 of you uh, somehow lunch today. So um, I think it actually went very well. Um, the next thing I want to say is that, of course, this is only the beginning of the semester. Uh, and I just want to remind you that uh, September 23rd, which is next Tuesday, uh, you have an urban, urban growth seminar called Water Policy and Water Mists in California drought edition. How cute is that? Um, and then uh, on the 26th you have, um, which is a Friday, improving decision making for magic mega infrastructure projects, which is another Metran seminar. Um, and then there's another urban growth seminar on high-speed rail, um, rail uh, station design on the 30th. So, um, you have lots of choices um, here at USC. I also can let you know now that on the um, Price website, if you go to the research um, page on the Price website, there's a page that says um, research seminars and events, uh, and you ha will see there all of the seminar series for the whole school, so you have a lot to choose from. So. Uh, the last thing is, and I'm just on time, um, is please do pick up your boxes and deposit them in the trash cans outside. We got special permission to let you all eat in here today. So thank you very much. <laughs>